I mean, I don't know what your week has been like, uh, but I'm guessing that at least some of you have felt run down by anxieties, by disappointments, by fear, stress, worry, possibly even tragedy and heartache. And if not this week, well then in the past and sometime in the future, you will experience this. You may feel as though you figuratively crawled in here this morning. And that's common, isn't it? It's common to be overwhelmed by life circumstances. It's common to feel overwhelmed by the storms of life. And God, through his beloved David, is going to show us how to deal, how to cope in these sorts of situations with this week's prayer from the heart. So pray with me, uh, and then we'll read his word, God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, King David, your beloved. Uh, Thank you, Father, that though he was your beloved and uh, he has so much written about him in the Bible, uh, he's just a a person like us with feet of clay. Uh, Father, help us to see today uh, how we are to look to you, uh, how we are to see who you are, see you for who you are, and look to you in all situations. Uh, Help us to do that today, but help us to do that in the weeks to come. Amen. Uh, On page 488, Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Concerning David, when he pretended to be insane in the presence of Abimelech, who drove him out and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his holy ones fear the Lord, for those who fear him lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry, but those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to remove all memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. One who is righteous has many adversities, but the Lord rescues him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil brings death to the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. This is the word of the Lord. (coughs) Uh, On the inside of the notice sheet, there's a sermon outline there, and then over on the top right, there's a few questions to think about over lunch and during the week. Uh, First, I want to look at the elephant in the room. Well, at least it was for me when I was reading. At the very start of our passage, we have these words. It's actually verse 1, even though it doesn't say it's verse 1, I don't think, in the Bible. Of David, yep, that's okay. When he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. What on earth is he on about? And similarly, as it speaks of the same event, Psalm 56 begins, For the choir director, according to a silent dove far away. That's nice, isn't it? A mictam of David, well, that's a musical thingy. 
when the Philistines seized him in Gath. On first reading Psalm 34 and then 56 and Samuel 1, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21, uh, to go along with it, I have so many questions. Should David, the anointed king of Israel, be amongst the Philistines in Gath where Goliath and his family are from? Is his pretend insanity consistent with the dignity of God's chosen king? Should God be praised because David pretended pretended to be insane and so escape danger? How can a psalm which condemns deceit be based upon the actions of a deceiver that we see in 1 Samuel 21? How is it possible for David, in the words of Psalm 34, to seek and pursue peace with Goliath's sword in his hand? In the ultimate example of keeping your friends close and your enemies closer, It seems that David fled to the Philistines because he didn't believe God could spare his life any other way. Yet this is what the psalm is all about. And if you read in 1 Samuel, you'll see that God has already protected him many times. He was willing to make an alliance with Israel's enemies in order to feel safe and secure. The Philistines who once fled from David, the warrior of Israel, were now who David was looking to for protection from Saul. <clears throat> David's actions, or at least some of them, were wrong. Not only are we hard-pressed to praise David for his cunning, I wonder how is it possible to praise God for David's deliverance, as he urges us to do. How can we possibly take seriously the instructions David gives in the psalm? In Psalm 21 verse 12, sorry, in 1 Samuel 21 verse 12, we read, David took this to heart and became very afraid of King Achish of Gath. It was David's fear of Saul that made him flee to Gath. It was David's fear of man that caused him to deceive others with his lips. It was David's fear that led him to the conclusion that he must fake madness before Achish if he were to survive. You can't help but wonder, is this the same young bloke that killed lions and bears to save his his lambs? Or who faced up to Goliath only a couple of years earlier? Well, don't despair. The conclusion that I've come to is that we need to look at the two Psalms, and especially Psalm 34 since we're looking at it today, uh, as being written when David was able to look back on these events at a later point in time and had come to understand that he had acted out of the fear of man and not the fear of God. He was humbled before God and wrote Psalm 56 as his confession and vow of trust. Then Psalm 34 was written to praise God for his deliverance in spite of David's deception and sin and to teach the principles leading to the praise of the Lord and the fear of the Lord which David had learned through this painful experience. With a renewed trust in God, David now realises that mere man can do nothing against him while God is his defence and his refuge. So with all that in mind, Psalm 34 And the call here is to praise the Lord. If we want to experience the goodness of God, even when we are overwhelmed, even when we are struggling, we are called to praise him. Look at verse 1. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. David wants always to be praising the Lord and he invites others to do the same. He says in verse 3, proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. And you can see this isn't just lukewarm praise. No, he boasts in the Lord. The Lord is his boast. And this is not just during the good times. This is all the time. He says, I will praise the Lord at all times. And it's not a silent act. He's not just praising God, praying in his heart. He says, the praise of the Lord will be on my lips. Others can hear the praise that he's making. And it's not a private act. He wants others involved. He says, let us exalt his name together. Now, I want you to notice who is invited to exalt the Lord with him. It says at the end of verse 2, let the humble hear and be glad. It's the humble who are invited. David himself has been humbled, humbled before the Lord. Humility, being empty of self, is what actually brings happiness. It provokes praise. 
Humility opens the floodgates of praise. And on the other hand, our pride, our self-centeredness, our self-sufficiency, well, that closes the gates. We're more likely to praise ourselves. That stunts praise. It's like a roadblock to praise. David is calling the humble. There is a direct line from humility, from being brought low and seeking God, to praising him. Humility provokes praise. So I hope that gives you a great encouragement, especially if circumstances of your life or your own sin has brought you to a place where you feel low, where you feel helpless, even hopeless. Uh, There are a couple of other points that we need to take from this uh, first section. And the first is that we need to be people who talk about the goodness of God out loud. We need to speak it. Our neighbours need to hear it. Our friends need to hear it. Our co-workers need to hear it. Our families need to hear it. We need to hear it. We need to hear ourselves say it out loud. We need to be people like David can say, the praise of the Lord is on our lips. And the second one is, did you notice David's call to community? We need to worship together. David says, let us exalt his name together. Let's be together. Joy is not complete until it is shared. We need to worship together. School holidays have certainly shrunk our number. But if we're able, we're all here today and perhaps some are watching online. It's a wonderful thing. And my encouragement to all of us is simple. Keep on with it. Keep on with it. Keep coming back. Keep making corporate worship an important part of your lives. You need others. Others need you. We need to worship together. So in order to experience the goodness of God, we need to humbly praise him. That means no matter where you are, as Dan said, you can praise the Lord, even if your circumstances might be screaming otherwise, especially then. You can praise the Lord, and in doing that, you will experience his goodness and you can share it with others. Uh, Point two, and that's uh, seek the Lord. Now the psalm calls us to seek the Lord. To experience God's goodness, his closeness, his rescue, we must seek him. Draw near to him. This is looking to God. This is reading his word. This is prayer. This is turning to God in the struggles of our life, in our fear, in our trouble, looking to him and hoping in him, seeking him and drawing near. You'll notice in verse 4 and 6 that David gives his personal testimony. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. He says, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him. Now that word poor there, is not, it's not financially poor. It's the same word as humble in verse 2. Well, why, would we, why should we seek him? David gives us reasons if we don't know. He says in verse 5, those who look to him are radiant with joy. They light up. They are so full of joy that they are glowing. Uh, Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner says the word for radiant describes the face of a mother finding a lost child that she thought was gone forever. Looking to the Lord makes us radiant. It says you will never be ashamed. It won't backfire if you look to the Lord, if you look to God. There is no chance. It's a certain reality that you will not be ashamed. And not only that, verse 7 tells us that those who seek the Lord will experience his nearness, his protection, his deliverance. It says the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. How can that be? Well, it's because God is really good. He truly is good. But that's the lie that our hearts and that the world wants to tell us. As old as the Garden of Eden, the lie that God holds back the best. That is not quite that good. But he truly is good. And ultimately, when you seek God and when you draw near to him, that's what you'll find, that he is more amazing, more magnificent than you can even imagine. Think of Mount Capitar as you look at it from town. 
Some days it's just a grey blob on the horizon. But as you get closer to the base and up the mountain, everything becomes more and more beautiful, more amazing. The individual mountains, the rock formations, the different greenery, even those awesome pink slugs, it becomes stunningly beautiful the closer we get to it. In the same way, the closer you get to God, the more you look to him, the more you seek him, the more of his goodness, his beauty, his love, his mercy you will see. I look at verses 8 to 10. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord, for those who fear him lack nothing. And then this young lions lack food, or the <coughs> excuse me, alternate translation uh, could be that even the rich lack food. But young lions lack food and go hungry, but those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Seek the Lord. <coughs> you see, David came to know, verse 7, to be true, that those who fear the Lord, God draws near to them, encamps around them protects them and delivers them. He knew that God is a God who draws near and yet we should know that far more clearly, that God is a God who draws near. We can see it more clearly because we can look back to the person and work of Jesus who left his throne in heaven. John says he came and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent in our backyard, as it were. He suffered, he died, and he rose to deliver us from our sins. So it's actually in Jesus that you experience the goodness of God most fully. It's in him. And you'll find that as you are seeking him, that he has in fact been seeking you. That he is a God who draws near to us, and it's actually God who is drawing us to him. So my question for all of us is, what is it that is holding you back from seeking the Lord at all times, from praising him at all times? Is it guilt? Is it shame? Is it regret? Or is it, is it just apathy? But the truth of the gospel is that Jesus has removed all those obstacles. In fact, your feelings of shame and regret and guilt can only deepen your experience of his goodness, his mercy and his love. So don't wait. Seek the Lord and you will experience his goodness. Um, Point three is um, obey the Lord or follow him. It's interesting, this next section of Psalm 34, it reads almost like the start of a proverb, doesn't it? David says, come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. It's like you could take it and put it in the book of Proverbs and it would fit perfectly. It says children, but of course it's talking to us, to all of us. The point is that this good God, this good captain, this good Lord that we have sought, that we have praised, that we know to love us, he's a God worth obeying. He's a God worth following. His ways are good, and that means when we follow his ways, we'll experience his goodness. When we obey him, we will experience how good he is. Godliness is never the way to earn his love, but it is certainly the way that we experience it. Godliness is not how we earn salvation, but it is how we experience how good God is. So follow him, obey him. Specifically in verse 13, David says, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. He talks about these sins of the tongue like gossip and slander and dishonesty. <clears throat> These are things that erode life. They objectify and they use others. They destroy and they harm. And these things must be bitter and unthinkable to us. We must keep our tongue from evil, but more broadly, he says in verse 14 and 15, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. We are to be proactive about doing right about doing good Uh, for those of you who hunt or fish you know the process is much more extensive than just going out in the scrub with a gun or chucking a hook in the water 
It takes going to bed early and getting up early, putting on the right clothes and usually travelling out of town and knowing the spot to go. It takes a lot of patience and planning and preparation just to possibly get a shot at whatever it is you're after. In the same way, we need to pursue, we need to hunt peace and righteousness. We need to be patient and persistent and proactive. There's lots of peace. And intentional about looking for opportunities to do good and pursue peace. We should hunt well. We should seek peace and pursue it. And in doing so, the promise is that we will experience, we will taste and see how good God is. Of course, righteousness and godliness can be costly. It can cost us. The Christian life is not all sunshine and rainbows. It's costly. It can be hard to follow Jesus. It can cost us time. It can cost us money. It can cost us reputations or standing. It can cost even more than that. But there's deep encouragement here. Some of you have been or will be or perhaps are being mistreated in one way or another. It seems like nobody knows and nobody cares. Maybe you're being mistreated for righteousness, for Jesus' sake. There might even be people who know and don't care enough to act. But the reality that we are presented with here in this psalm is that God does see. God does hear. His ears are open. His word tells us that, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. God sees, God knows, and in his time he will act. As Dan said, it mightn't happen in this lifetime, but this lifetime is not all there is. It's just a mere flash. God is a just, good, righteous God and he defends the righteous. He defends his people those who believe in, love and serve Jesus. And for those of you who are suffering at the hands of others, do not repay evil for evil. Now, 1 Peter 3 actually quotes this part of the psalm and after Peter does, he says, Do not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary bless. Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. As Christians, we don't use the tools of this world to fight against mistreatment. We don't fight fire with fire. On the contrary, we repay evil with good. We bless, as Peter says. And with that comes something far better than we can imagine. The deep, real, spiritual blessing of of experiencing how good God is. So it's true that those who taste and see the goodness of God will be moved to greater obedience. When you see how good God is, it makes you want to follow him, to obey him. But it's also true that those who obey him will experience his goodness. Do you want to taste and see that the Lord is good? Obey him, follow him. Let him lead you in the paths of righteousness. Even when it's hard, follow him and you will experience the goodness of God. Uh, Point four now is take refuge in the Lord. We've praised the Lord, we've sought him, we've obeyed him and lastly take refuge in God, in the Lord. He is our rock, he is our righteousness, he is our hiding place and we must take refuge in him. It starts back in verse 8, how happy is the person who takes refuge in him. It goes on in verse 18, the Lord is near the brokenhearted, he saves those crushed in spirit. And David closes out the psalm in verse 22, the Lord redeems the life of his servants and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. Is there a greater, more comforting sentence in Scripture? If you take refuge in God, you will not be punished. And we can see from the verses there that that punishment is not just getting the cane at school back in the day. 
It's eternal punishment that's being talked about. The more you seek God, the more you follow him and strive after godliness, the more you experience the depths of your own sin, the more you experience the darkness of this world and you see the darkness of your own heart. But regardless of our sin, life can be brutally difficult. There can be hardships, difficulties and tragedies that have nothing to do with any sin that you've committed. It's just a sad fact of this fallen world. And to this, verse 19 says... One who is righteous has many adversities, but the Lord rescues him from them all. God is the only refuge for the sinner and the sufferer, so we must take refuge in him. There's no refuge in this world from those things. Uh, In April, there were a large number of tornadoes in the US Midwest, and I saw footage of a family coming out of their shelter under what used to be their house. The remains of the house lay smashed to pieces around the foundations. It looked just like someone sat an excavator in the middle of it and spun it round and round. But they were unharmed thanks to their place of refuge. The strong winds of suffering and sickness and fear and troubles can destroy us, leaving us without even a taste of goodness forever. Unless we take refuge in Jesus, unless we make God our shelter. We flee to him and take refuge in him because he is the righteous one. He is the only one that can shield us from the consequences of sin because he alone suffered to take away the sin of the world. And one day Revelation 21 tells us that he will wipe every tear from our eyes. Jesus himself He is our only true and lasting hiding place from both sin and the affliction of the world. So we must take refuge in him. Not only does he rescue, but God protecting the bones of the righteous in verse 20 is a promise of resurrection. He protects them to restore them. We see this in Ezekiel's valley of dry bones and in Joseph wanting his bones carried to the promised land because he believed that God would not only restore the Israelites to the promised land, but that was a promise of a future restoration as well. And God instructed his people not to break the bones of the Passover lamb because one day God would raise the true Passover lamb back to life. So John quotes this verse in John 19.36 when describing the death of Jesus. Jesus is going to rise. He won't stay dead. He didn't stay dead. These unbroken bones are a sign. God is keeping them. God will raise them. You might ask, does God always deliver the righteous? Well, the answer is a resounding yes. From all fears, from all troubles, from all afflictions, God will protect all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Which is to say that, yes, there will be fears, there will be troubles, afflictions, even death. And there will be resurrection on the other side. God will deliver his people, not in their preferred timing perhaps, but in his. So for those of you who are weary from this fallen world, take refuge in the Lord. By coming to Jesus and you will experience his everlasting goodness. He is your redeemer. He protects. He provides. He will never leave you or forsake you. And though you may not see it now, one day you will be able to say with full conviction that there was never a time when God was not good to you. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. Not one of those who take refuge in him will be punished forever.